Hello, my name is Juan Matute. I am the deputy director of the UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies, uh, organizer of this symposium, and also a voiceover actor available for hire for your webinar needs. Um, today we'll be uh, learning about transit finance, um, which has changed significantly in the past 18 months. In fact, perhaps more so in the past 18 months than in the prior 50 years. <clears throat> we are um, uh, fortunate to be joined by three experts in the field. Um, Dr. Asha Argawal of the Mineta Transportation Institute, uh, Robert Puentes of the Eno Center, and Michael Pimentel of the California Transit Association. Um, so as those of us involved in transit know, uh, the finances have been temporarily boosted by a series of federal stimulus bills. Uh, California's budget surplus has also provided additional funding for transit. But what happens after agencies exhaust those one-time funds and one-time infusions of funds? We'll be hearing more about this uh, from our expert panel today. Uh, Asha, uh, so our first speaker, uh, well, our two speakers uh, delivering presentations will each give about a 17 minute presentation. And then we'll have follow-up remarks uh, from Michael Pimentel of the California Transit Association. We'll then join in discussion and take some questions from the audience. So be sure to add your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the presentations. Uh, you'll also be able to vote on questions um, as others are submitting them. And so our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Asha Agarwal of the um, San Jose State Institute, uh, San Jose State University, where she's director of MTI's National Transportation Finance Center, also education director of MTI and a professor of urban and regional planning. Asha's research agenda is guided by a commitment to the principles of sustainability and equity, what policy and planning tools can, can communities adopt to encourage environmentally friendly travel and move accessibility for people struggling with poverty and other disadvantages. Dr. Agarwal has researched transportation funding policy for more than 20 years with a focus on holistic evaluation of the pros and cons of different tax and fee options. And her work has appeared in many national outlets, including uh, the, the Washington Post and the CBS Evening News. Uh, so with that, Asha will be telling us about transportation finance up until about March of 2020, when something fairly significant happened. Thank you so much, Juan, for that introduction and to all the organizers of today's events for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So I am going to try to set some big picture context. And then I believe that um, our other speakers will be delving a lot more into the nitty gritty details, particularly of, of, of course, what's happening today. So I was asked to talk about paying for public transit from 2000-ish to 2019. And I wanna start by saying that the premise I'm taking for this presentation is that the community-wide transit services we want for our, you know, our communities don't cover their costs through fares or the other revenue that transit operators in the United States typically um, are able to raise. So there needs to be some source of money beyond the fares. So then the question I want to explore today is who is that fairy godmother, so to speak, who's been making up the difference for us? And I chose the, the term fairy godmother after a bit of careful thought, I uh, looked it up in the dictionary. It is defined as a generous friend or benefactor. And I also think though that, you know, culturally we tend to assume that a fairy godmother is giving of her beneficence to somebody deserving. Um, and I think with public transit, it's important probably just the premise for this whole conversation today to remind ourselves, you know, why would the public sector want to pay for public transit? And um, there are many arguments and nuances one would go into, but I would say just as if we um, government 
funds schools and roads for that matter in ways beyond what direct users pay, we see a similar role for funding transit, which achieves all kinds of benefits from providing accessibility to the large fraction of people who don't have the ability to drive themselves around to potentially reducing cars on the road and benefits of congestion and air quality and all those other good things. So Asha, this is a great premise. I know you have slides for it as well. Uh, can you share your screen so we can, we can oh, see no. that? Oh no, oh um, no, no, I'm so sorry. I forgot that part. Okay, and um, I had worked a great deal on my slides. So let me go back and quickly get those up. Okay, thank you Juan for that reminder. So paying for public transit um, and then um, the premise sort of, you know, we don't have enough money just from fares to pay for transit. So who is this fairy godmother, um, so to speak, that's making up the difference? And um, I next will mention just very as a small aside, um, I was actually delighted to be able to think of a topic where I could talk about my current work in fairies because it brings together different parts of my life. I was actually a folklore and mythology major in college and my senior thesis was, as you see here, the subject is fairy tales, history and criticism. So the fairies may seem a little silly, but I did think it was a useful analogy for what we're talking about today. At any rate, the next thing I want to do is revise my title slightly. So I was asked to talk about 2000 to you know, pre-COVID, but I actually would like to go at a very high conceptual level a little bit farther back, because I think it's what I hope I can provide today is really just setting this sort of conceptual or theoretical context for a much more detailed discussion of current revenue sources and where we may go in the future. So what I'm gonna talk through is first, um, does the fairy know there's a transit fairy godmother? I have a small bit of evidence to provide there. Um, reflect a little bit on who today's fairy godmother might be, and then turn to a very whirlwind history of looking farther back in time. So in terms of whether US adults realize that their fares did not cover the full cost of providing transit service, I'll share just a few details from a survey that I've done. Um, this is a 2017 survey funded by the Mineta Transportation Institute and my, my co-author Hillary Nixon is with her, us today. At any rate, this was a national survey and we asked people, when people ride public transit, they pay a fare. This money is used to pay for the service. Do you think that the money collected from public transit fares in general covers the full cost of the service? And what we learned is that 58% of our respondents knew or, or believed that there was a fairy godmother, so to speak, that somebody beyond just fare paying riders were providing the revenue that runs the service. Um, the 11%, by the way, who said they don't know might be the most honest in the group, <laughs> um, but, but there were 31%, so virtually a third who think their fares cover, the fares other people are paying, cover the full cost. Um, we also asked a follow-up question where, um, of the people who thought that fares didn't cover the full amount, we asked if they thought the federal, state, or local governments um, contributed. So what we're showing here is the percentage of people who believed that there was contributions from the federal government, so that was 41%, the state and the local. So very roughly kind of half of people were a little less were aware of contribution, contributions from each level of government with um, the state being kind of the best known of these. And again, this was a national survey. So, oh, actually I realized I had switched my, um, order. Let me start with the history. Um, so the whirlwind history of transit's fairy godmothers. The first public transit system, um, sort of by conventional transportation history lore, was started in 1662 by the French, um, better known as a mathematician, Blaise Pascal, and it was called Les Carrosses à Saint-Sol, which is essentially like the carriages for five pennies. 
And King Louis XIV, he of Versailles and all that fame, granted a monopoly for horse-drawn vehicles to run along regular routes in Paris. Um, but the system did not last. Um, I think after roughly a decade, it shut down for a variety of reasons, um, but it's sort of, at least again, what we sort of know from the popular history, the Parliament of Paris uh, banned so-called commoners from riding in the carros, and then the police started an official policy of beating commoners who interfered with the vehicles, and so there was no fairy who stepped in to, to help the system out, and it died fairly quickly. Now, if we look at the U.S. Um, and slightly more recently, I want to make an argument that there has always been this fairy godmother for any large scale public transit service that's community wide and so forth, but that it has changed and it in fact was not always the government that was playing this role. Um, so in kind of the late 1800s and early 1900s, what we might think of as the streetcar era in the United States, transit um, services, and these were largely built and paid for by real estate developers. Um, and they were not doing this as just a sort of public service. This was a way to sell land. Um, they would run lines out into undeveloped you know, rural areas around central cities. And then once transit service was there, they could subdivide it and build and sell. Um, and so they provided quite heavy subsidies to the systems for, for a while. However, um, eventually that stopped providing a solid funding basis for the transit system. A variety of things happened. Um, a lot of the land that could have been sold had now been sold. And also the municipal governments who had franchise agreements with these, these um, entities um, often limited fares um, and prevented any fare increase, which over time became a problem. Um, and also many of the transit operators had in their original franchises agreed to cover street paving costs for the streets that their systems were on. And that was a very heavy cost. Um, so we can see actually another theme, which is that if the public sector often wants transit services to do things that are in the public interest, that wouldn't necessarily be something just a private profit-seeking entity would want to do. And so we essentially um, saddle or put those costs onto the transit operator. Um, so in this case, for example, street paving being an example. So as the systems <clears throat> were sort of losing their, their fairy godmothers from real estate, um, who should step in, but in many places, electric utilities? which might seem like a surprising new fairy godmother, but there were a variety of reasons. Um, one, probably not the most important, but important was that if you were an electric utility and you had an electric streetcar service, it was, you, know, you could provide the power. Um, you got a customer for your power and you could private, provide it cheaply. But also it had to do with laws surrounding natural monopolies and their profits were limited to a percentage of their assets, so or their capital assets. So they had an incentive to buy more assets because then could then be earning that profit off a larger base. However, um, then um, the federal government broke up, uh, passed laws breaking up a lot of these monopolies and saying in a region you couldn't be the electric utility and the streetcar, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, the, the electric utility started wanting to shed the streetcar operators and auto and bus industry and sort of affiliates like Firestone Tires came in and took over a lot of these services. Um, as a side note, many of you may have um, seen or heard of the film um, what, who framed Roger Rabbit, which is a kind of fictionalized story that's making the auto and bus industry out to be the villains. And it, it's not quite that straightforward. Um, these were not thriving, flourishing, financially, these were not thriving, flourishing um, transit systems when they were taken over. World War II came, huge boom, lots of people riding transit, 
not much money or time or metal or materials to kind of be upgrading and maintaining. And so when the war ended, the services had just been run into the ground and also ridership fell off in, in a lot of places. And so these companies were going bankrupt and um, local governments were often the ones who stepped in because they didn't wanna have no transit service for their community. Um, but they quickly realized that they were having trouble funding them and started clamoring for help from the federal government. And this was in the 60s and 70s when the federal government was also um, heavily focused on sort of revitalizing central cities. And so helping with these transit systems fit into that larger federal goal. Um, but the federal government did not forever continue increasing, increasing the revenue it provided. And so in the 1980s and 90s, you saw state governments and local governments stepping in and providing more and more of the revenue. So that is the whirlwind tour of fairy godmothers. Um, and let's now turn um, a little bit to the, today and where the revenues currently come from. Um, since money doesn't grow on trees, where are our transit fairy godmothers getting it? Um, the short answer would be no one knows, it's magic. Um, the more com accurate answer would be it's basically a complex Byzantine mess that very few people truly understand. There are a few very smart people who work for our transit operators and understand this, but any transit agency is relying on a large number of different sources of revenue. Um, for a larger agency, it's going to be dozens, and even for a smaller one, it might. Further complicating it, every agency is different. You know, every state provides its own context and level of funding, but even within states, you know, local entities have their own mixes of um, sources of revenue. So I would not even pretend to be able to explain all of it to you right now, um, let alone in, in many hours. But here I wanna share just a broad overview to give you a sense of how complex the funding picture is. Um, so on the left, we have the, the revenue that's actually raised by the transit operators themselves. So this is obviously fares and bulk transit pass purchases and such. Um, and then a variety of other revenue sources from advertising, facility leases, parking fees, concessions, um, value capture, and in a few places. So <clears throat> that's what the money that, so it's fares plus, so to speak. Then the other two columns I've organized essentially by the tax base. So the middle column is taxes on people buying and using vehicles. And depending on the specific one we're talking about, these can be imposed at the federal, state, regional, local level. So there are gas taxes, um, taxes on vehicles and vehicle parts, truck weight fees, vehicle registration fees, tolls, parking fees, starting to have a few ride hailing fees, um, refuse vehicle impact fees, and so on. Um, and then we have others, which are, you know, more general taxes that are primarily coming from the state and local government. Um, and the sales taxes, certainly in California, but I think in much of the country, also both state and local sales taxes have really in the last 20, 30 years become a central source of revenue for our transit operators. But then local governments rely on many other sources as well, whether that's a hotel tax or business license tax, franchise agreements, um, property taxes, development fees, and so forth. Also in California, we now have revenue from the state's cap and trade program, some of which um, can be, end up being spent for public transit purposes. So how much, for now, does each of these governments levels of government or government fairies give. So this is looking just at the last, it's from 2003 to 2017. Um, and I don't think things have changed remarkably between 2017 and the start of COVID. 
So this is transit operations. So it's ignoring capital, um, but just looking at operations, the dashed line at the top is the total amount of revenue. And these are in 2020 dollars. Um, by the way, someone asked if the slides will be shared and I'm assuming they will. Um, so the top has the dashed line, that's the total in real inflation adjusted dollars. Currently, we're at a little shy of 9 billion, which is very roughly 50% growth over this period. Now, the four solid lines below are showing the revenue contributed by local governments, federal and state, and passenger fares. And I think the next obvious thing is that the top one of those four lines is the gold colored one, which is the local contribution. So that is considerably more than any of the others and indeed roughly half the total. Um, the passenger fares and federal lines are kind of intermingled there. And then at the very bottom, we have the state contribution. Now this is the same data, but instead of looking at actual dollar values, here we have um, for each year, what percentage of the total comes from each level of government. And again, you'll see that we have um, kind of the green on the far left is fares. This is roughly a quarter. On the other, on the far right, the gray is the federal contribution slightly less, but essentially, again, maybe a quarter. Then in the middle, we have that big chunk, which is essentially half um, coming from local government. And then the state, that small little segment, um, you know, well under two digits in um, dark blue. And well, there's been like a little bit of movement from year to year, the basic pattern hasn't changed much. Um, the main so yeah, so I think we can say that that's been sort of roughly in California for operations, the picture over the last two decades, more or less. So um, just to try and wrap up now with a few thoughts. So who has been the public transit industries? fairy godmother. Um, it's been quite a crowd of fairies, actually, um, from land developers, to electric utility, the auto industry, and then, of course, different levels of government. So um, here was, I think, the summary. Again, I see these as conceptual points that can help frame a more detailed discussion. Um, but first, that public transit services, the kinds we want, always require money beyond what ride riders pay, similarly to roads or schools or other um, functions and government funds. That when the early private sector ferries lost interest, we had our public sector ferries step in. Um, and today, uh, state, but especially local government, at least in California, are by far the largest contributors. Um, and then that every agency really relies on this terribly complex mix of sources that pretty much no one understands, but sales tax revenue tends to be a key central point. And so I think some, some questions that we could ask moving forward are what's the appropriate appropriate proportion of state and federal support for these systems that are, you know, in essence, local? Um, should we try to replace this complex patchwork of many different sources with a few that each give more? And then finally, what could states do or could state of California to better empower local and regional governments to raise money on their own, since it doesn't seem like the federal or state fairy godmothers are likely to just become much, much more generous um, in the immediate future. So again, these slides will be going out. And so I have here just put together um, some of the references that I drew on and that anyone who wants to learn more might find interesting. And I do want to also acknowledge that many of the people I drew on have been Lake Arrowhead founders or participants over the decades, um, including Marty Wax, who's sadly passed away and not with us. Um, but I, although I'm not sure they're all listed here, people like Elizabeth Deacon, Brian Taylor, men, Robert Puentes, many of those with us have um, contributed greatly to my and all of our understanding on this topic. So with that, I will, uh, we can turn to the next speaker. All right, thank you, Asha, for that fascinating uh, look um, through the fairy tale lens at transit financing its history.
And so our next speaker will be Robert Puentes, who is the president and CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation, a nonprofit think tank with the mission of improving transportation policy and leadership. Prior to joining Eno, uh, Robert was at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Planning and Policy Program. He has worked extensively on a variety of transportation issues, including infrastructure funding and finance. He's a regular contributor to the news media and has testified before congressional committees. And, and I hope this is a, a more welcoming experience than uh, testimony, but uh, I guess you can give invited testimony that's better than compelled testimony. I, I assume it was invited and not compelled. All right. If you can share your slides, um, and you can take us through the past 18 and a half months of, of transportation finance, focus thanks. on transit. Will do. Thanks very much, Juan. Uh, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be talking about this with you today. I thought that the, the conference was a, was a great kickoff last week with, with Carrie and, and Brian Taylor talking about ridership trends, which are so baked into all, a lot of things that, that I'm going to hit on today. Um, and Asha's great remarks to, to lead off this session. What I've been asked to do is to, to lay out what's going on here on the federal level to support transit, as Juan mentioned, is been an awful lot over the last 18 months and building off of what Asha just went through, um, that we might have a fairy godmother, at least at least for the last uh, last couple, couple months. Um, the federal government certainly has ridden to the rescue in a lot of ways. We had some very important emergency relief and stimulus bills over the last year and a half. And of course, we have these big infrastructure bills that are now caught up in the you know oh so fun sausage making that is federal Washington. Uh, I'm going to lay all that out. It actually has been been very, very significant. So uh, let me, here we go. Uh, just a very, very quick commercial about us. Um, Eno oh, is so not an acronym. Robert, um, we are, um, I think we're having a ferry with technical problems. Um, so we're seeing that you are sharing your screen, uh, but that's all, we're not seeing any slides if you're intending to present them. Alrighty, let me stop sharing, start. Is that better? Uh, we're seeing it again. So um, Whitney, can you present uh, Robert's backup slides and we'll just advance them for you? Okay. Uh, but you could probably give us the introduction. Oh, we're seeing them now. Oh, because we're seeing Whitney's screen. All right, I'll get off and let you go. Just, uh, just say next slide um, as... as Will do. My, my apologies for that. You know, 18 months, you'd think I would have figured this out by now, but uh, <laughs> he will get there. But very, very quick commercial about us. Um, the Eno Center for Transportation um, is named after somebody. It's Mr. William Phelps Eno. Um, that's not his mugshot. That's actually his um, his honorary driver's license he got from, from Paris, I believe, or France. He never owned a car. He never, never drove in a car. Um, or drove a car, but he um, wrote the first traffic codes for places like New York and Paris and London. He endowed this foundation 100 years ago. This is actually our centenary this year. Um, we're the only organization, I believe, in the United States that's focused on all modes of transportation. We do everything from aviation and space to electric scooters and sidewalks and everything in between. We work up and down the Federalist chain. We're based here in DC, but we do a lot of work with city, states, and metros across the country and increasingly across the world. And we work with the public and the private and the nonprofit sectors. We don't do that all at the same time. We're trying to focus on areas where we can have the most direct relevance and impact. And as I'll talk about right now, the place where we're having the most impact is paying attention and following and helping people understand what's going on here on the federal level. Because as I said, it has been, has been very significant. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So as Carrie and Brian described last week, it is hard to overstate the changes um, and the challenges that are facing public transit right now. Uh, there's been enormous drops um, in transit ridership since March of 2020. Um, lines aren't showing up for some reason on the, on the screen. You can see what's happened to transit. Um, you know, we, we've had these drops that have hit transit very hard and continue to do so. We did see a little uptick uh, in the spring this year. I think that data, um, we'll show that it's actually dropped back down again. 
what's not showing up for some reason is um, the VMT trends for driving, which have not been as dramatic. They kind of have stayed steady um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And aviation, which completely bottomed out, even worse than transit at the beginning of the pandemic, but have now started to um, to to get back to kind of where they were before. But the the the, the, the drops in transit ridership really are very significant. And it's important to keep in mind what um, Brian and Carrie were talking about last week with the splits between rail and bus. You know, it's a big country, transit is a big thing. Um, we've seen plummeting um, ridership for things like commuter rail and heavy rail, 90, 85, 75%. But bus ridership um, has really only dropped by about a half in most places because it's moving really essential um, uh, or dependent workers people who really do need um, the bus for their everyday activities. Uh, next slide, please. So among other things, the drop in ridership has meant less money for transit in the form of, of passenger fares. Of course, we know that, um, uh, that fares do not cover all of transit's operating costs, um, but these losses still are a, a big problem for transit. Um, at the same time, we know that most agencies had to go fareless at the start of the pandemic to keep workers safe or you know, all kinds of safety and health reasons. Some actually continue to do so. They still have remained um, uh, fareless. And in other places, state and local transit money was diverted uh, to address different COVID related needs. Asha walked through a whole bunch of those, um, for the, the variety of sources that go into public transit on the local level because they're very flexible. A lot of places started moving that around to help, um, to help uh, other areas of, of COVID relief. A uh, team working for, for APTA, for the Public Transit Association here in Washington, found that collectively transit agencies face a shortfall of about $40 billion through 2023. That's a, actually a typo. It's not annually each year. It's totally uh, you know, $40 billion through 2023. Still quite a bit of, um, of financial and funding challenges that they are facing. This is due to the loss of income in addition to added expenses that came along with new protocols, new cleaning, um, and just overall expenses with keeping these systems running. Until recently, many agencies, especially smaller ones, were operating at dramatically reduced capacity. That's kind of ticked back up again for reasons I'll talk about in a second. And we had these really surreal situations with transit general managers that were they're begging people not to ride their systems. <laughs> After years of trying to get people to ride transit, they were in this completely um, opposite position saying, please don't ride transit unless you have to. Um, unless you're in a, you know, it's, it's, it's required for you to get to work if you're an essential worker, um, both to protect the riders themselves, but also to protect their workforce who was very, very seriously put in harm's way, especially at the beginning um, of the pandemic. It's, again, so in short, it's very hard to overstate the existential challenges um, facing transit, particularly since March of 2020. Next slide, please. Fortunately, the federal response has been uncharacteristically robust, um, depending on how you slice it, uh, but the set of emergency legislation that's relevant to transit amounted to about $5 trillion across the board for, for everything that was going into these relief bills. And just for reference, that's about 10 times the, uh, the cost of the interstate highway systems, uh, you know, what that will cost adjusted for inflation. So an enormous amount of, of aid coming from federal Washington. There was over 70, $171 billion for transportation alone. And you can see here from the chart, most of that going to transit and aviation, um, you know, a little bit so for highways and, and Amtrak and some other things. But a lot of it was just going into keeping these systems functioning um, because of the, 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 the gigantic drops that I mentioned at the beginning that were going on um, in, in transit and in aviation. Next slide, please. And on the transit side, at least, agencies are certainly um, spending that, that federal help. Uh, according to a recent APTA survey, about half of the agencies said that the federal money helped them avoid what would have been a complete shutdown in service. I think a lot of us saw that, um, at least the threat of that happening in our own communities. And the overwhelming majority of agencies said that the funding helped them avoid layoffs and furloughs. Again, very difficult situations for the transit workforce at the time. And you can see from the slide that almost all of the CARES Act money, which came in, in uh, March of 2020, has been spent with other relief funds expected to be gone by about 2023, maybe a little bit after that. Um, but these three um, chunks are the make up the vast majority of the federal relief that was coming since March of 2020. 
But the bottom line here is that it, it really isn't hyperbole to say that the federal money was vital to the very survival of public transit in the United States, especially during this time. Next slide, please. But there's more that um, Washington still needs to do. There's an awful lot that's still under consideration and it is a very strange and challenging time to be in Washington right now because of everything that's going on. When I first put these slides together a few weeks ago, this slide actually looked very different. I thought that the, you know, what we were gonna be talking about today was, <laughs> was different than it was a few weeks ago. But fortunately, Congress did pass a continuing resolution to keep the government open, but that's only through December 3rd. That was number one thing that they needed to do. Or not number one thing, but one of the most important things they needed to do. Um, some federal transportation workers, though, were, were furloughed last weekend since the extension of the federal transportation law, which expired at the end of September, the, the FAST Act, um, did get caught up in all that messiness. But the extension did get passed, and it kept the government, or it's keeping the program running through the end of the month, through October 31st. So, so those are good. Um, still to go is this infuriating debate around whether or not to raise the debt limit. Um, you're sure you've seen that this is a, a major topic of conversation uh, here in Washington. The government would start defaulting on its debt sometime in near the end of October if this isn't taken care of. The hope is that it's going to do, going to, and this is just kind of political uh, nonsense that's going on here, but that has to be done. But then after that, we get into you know, these two big pieces of legislation, the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package, which is colloquially you know, termed as the human infrastructure part of this, a lot of social services and, and, and progressive supports for um, you know, across the domestic space, the Build Back Better plan also as, as it's coined. And of course, the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill, which includes the reauthorization of the federal transportation law, both of these would be helpful for transit, especially the latter. So let's just dig into that um, for a minute because it's it really is mind boggling how much we're talking about here. Next slide, please. So the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, combines previously approved funds, which is the baseline for the funding, with about $550 billion in additional spending. The United States Department of Transportation would receive the largest share of that. So that's $274 billion on top of the $294 billion baseline, which, which kind of um, adds up to about $568 billion over five years for the Department of Transportation. By any measure, um, that's an awful lot of money. Next slide, please. But this is the slide that makes transit advocates mad. Uh, the, the, looks like the Federal Highway Administration would get the vast majority of this money but you have to keep in mind that this is coming from the contract authority that comes mostly from reauthorizing the surface transportation legislation. The green chunk, so that's the blue, the green chunk there is coming from the general funds from the, the, uh, the infrastructure bill. It's also important to note that this is just what comes from the bill itself and from the, from the, um, from the bipartisan package. It does not include whatever kind of annual appropriation committees might or might not give out each year, which is a really key part of uh, transit funding. We can also see here that federal railroad and aviation money uh, comes from the bill would all be from new general fund appro uh, appropriations. You know, those increases are coming from the bill, but those would be one-time infusions of money for um, for rail and for aviation. And then easy safety and some, some port stuff there too. Next slide, please. So even though the Federal Highway Administration and you know, roads and bridges and all that has the largest share since their baseline was what's much higher, the percent changes for the other modes really is very significant. And you can see it all broken down here best we can. This is coming from um, Jeff Davis here at Eno, who if you haven't been following his stuff, he's tracking this closer than literally anybody that I know. Um, doing, all, doing all this math and calculations for us. But for public transportation, the additional from the, the, um, the BID, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, uh, would be about a 65% increase over what the baseline is right now. You can see a little bit higher than, than what's going on with um, Federal Highway Administration or known here as roads and bridges. But note the enormous increases um, for things like intercity rail and for safety. Um, safety is safe streets. Um, uh, motor carriers, um, highways, things like, or um, um, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, things like that. Um, but for the intercity rail, this is something that the, the president was really looking for, of course, and the 66 billion that's in there is equal to 
all of the money that was appropriated to the Federal Railroad Administration in the last 18 years, right? That's that's about what that's equal to. So huge increases for, for inner city rail, for, uh, for aviation um, and for safety, but also again, not unhealthy for, for public transit. Next slide, please. This is the really astonishing slide as well. So a lot of that money is going out as, as um, you know, as formula grants, but this one uh, also added up by Jeff Davis shows the competitive grant programs that are included in this you know, 2,700 page piece of legislation. There is potentially $100 billion in discretionary grants that Secretary Buttigieg is gonna be able to award based on whatever criteria they apply to, to, these, to this packet of money. Some of this is new, like there's money for, let's see, the ADA upgrades for rail transit, um, which is something that I think Senator Duckworth put in there. You know, that's gonna be new programs. They gotta figure out how to spend. Some of it's not so new, the capital investment grants um, and things like that, but it's a ton, a ton of money that's gonna be at the discretion um, of the secretary. Um, this is the money that, especially this money that's going for transit. You can see it broken down here by the different agencies. Um, you know, $16 billion um, is an awful lot that the federal government's going to have to work with, going to put new criteria on, it's going to do rulemaking and all this, and it's going to have to be done probably pretty quickly. So um, in addition to the slog of money that's going to go out to places, um, it's important to pay attention to all this money that the federal government's going to be able to award competitively. Next slide, please, especially for transit. So the big question, you know, how are we going to pay for any of this? Um, as you all probably know, the Biden administration has pledged not to raise taxes on anybody making less than $400,000 a year. And that effectively eliminated the gas tax or carbon taxes or vehicle miles traveled fee as any kind of source that they could use to apply to, to any of this money, uh, to any of these programs. There are proposals now to increase things like the corporate income tax, um, the corporate money stored overseas, you know, all these things here. These are unlikely to um, to be to, to garner a bipartisan support here in, in Washington. So we're probably looking at federal money or federal borrowing, especially for the budget reconciliation package of this, because we haven't really um, identified new sources of money that would pay for these huge, you know, this huge piece of legislation. Next slide, please. So last thing here I just want to touch on, uh, you, know, you know, while these dollar amounts are, are really diz dizzying, I mean, these trillions of dollars we're just throwing around, it, it's, it's almost surreal. Let me just end with this, this little more sobering slide that, as you probably all know, the financial mainstay of the surface transportation program is the Highway Trust Fund, which includes both the highway account and the mass transit account, but it's called the Highway Trust Fund together. And um, as you probably know, we have not raised the gas tax on the federal level since 1993. And so the fund has been basically insolvent since 2008. So since then, since 2008, the federal government has had to uh, bail out the trust fund nine times by transferring money from the general fund um, to the highway trust fund to the tune of about $153 billion. The trust fund is usually fed by mostly by the gas tax, by a bunch of other taxes and fees because that's not sufficient to pay for the outlays that are coming out, the general fund money has had to, to do backfill on that. So if the bipartisan infrastructure bill passes, that'll jack that number up from 153 billion to 272 billion. And you can see the gap here, the, that red line, if it's cut off on your screen too, but on the, the solid red line is the, um, the money that's going out. The blue is the money that's coming in, supplemented by those spikes of green every time the federal government has had to inject more money. And that dotted red line is what would happen with these with the infrastructure bill. And you can see the gap ever widening. Now that may not be a concern to folks because we maybe should be funding transportation, um, not just public transit, but transportation through a lot of different sources. But right now there really isn't the political will in Washington to in increase any kind of, of user fees, especially on the highway side. Um, that lack of willpower does start with the administration historically uh, it's been the White House that does take the lead for unpopular tax increases in order to get them enacted, but that doesn't seem to be happening right now. And so continuing this imbalance is probably the most politically likely outcome. So at some point, we're going to have to reconcile or deal with this problem with the federal trust fund. Uh, last closing slide, please. So just in summary, you know, it, again, it's difficult to overestimate the challenges that are facing transit right now. The federal cavalry did ride to the rescue. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I love the fairy godmother analogy for that. Uh, they may have to do it again. Um, 
Whether it's going to happen or not is anybody's guess. It's a weird time in Washington. But there's an awful lot we still don't know about the future. I know we talked about this at the last um, session uh, you know, last week with Brian and, and Carrie. I do believe strongly that transit will bounce back for a lot of reasons. Um, but you know, I, it's, I think what's unknown is how long that is going to take. So again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I look forward to the questions and sorry for the technical problems. That's okay. Thank you, Robert. And I would like to remind participants that this is an interactive webinar. And so you can use the Q&A feature to pose some questions or vote on questions that have been posed by others. And it uh, looks like we have two so far in there. So you can get an idea of what's uh, been asked. So our next uh, speaker, our respondent, um, will be giving the California uh, perspective on both the history, uh, but then also uh, what Robert has presented of uh, the spike in federal funds for not only transit, but all of transportation, but we'll be, of course, focusing on transit. And that will be from uh, Michael Pemetel, the executive director of the California Transit Association. So take it away, Mike. All right. Well, thank you for that, Juan. And folks, I am Michael Pimentel, executive director of the California Transit Association, representing 85 transit and rail agencies in the state of California and more than 200 member organizations in the transit industry across the nation. I want to first begin my comments by thanking uh, the team at UCLA ITS, specifically Brian and Juan, for the opportunity to participate in this forum. Uh, now, Robert just detailed for you the COVID-19 pandemic's devastating impacts on public transit agencies and the services they provide more generally. I want to provide some additional background on how the pandemic has impacted California public transit agencies specifically before I then turn to that larger question about the future of transit in our state. Now, when the pandemic first reached California in March 2020 and the governor's stay at home orders went into effect, ridership at California's transit agencies dropped uh, by a range of 60 to 90 percent. Now, this spread in ridership losses largely reflected the differences in services provided by each transit agency, their service territories, and their respective uh, profiles for their typical transit rider. Now, as Robert had noted, bus agencies generally fared better than rail agencies in maintaining transit ridership during the pandemic. And this is largely because bus agencies have historically, and frankly, have continued to serve low-income riders with fewer travel options. Now, during the pandemic, these workers generally had no choice but to travel into work, whether that was in grocery stores and warehouses and the broader service sector, and they largely remained committed to public transit. Now, by contrast, the commuter rail agencies, uh, they have historically served higher income earners whose, whose jobs allowed their employees to work from home, and frankly, stay at home, they did. Uh, you saw some of the steepest ridership declines here in California at agencies like Caltrain in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as in the Bay Area Rapid Transit District. Now with these declines in ridership uh, came, as you heard from both uh, Robert and Asha, immediate and commensurate drops in passenger fares uh, that resulted for California transit agencies in billions of dollars in losses uh, in revenue. And as the economy slowed, so too did purchases and travel undercutting core funding sources for public transit that are generally interlaced with sales taxes, whether they're uh, issued and authorized by the state or by localities. At the same time, transit agencies were called on to do more, to buy new hospital grade cleaning supplies, to implement enhanced cleaning protocols, and to provide personal protective equipment to their transit operators and maintenance staff. These protocols were largely driven by guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention but they also were driven by the California Department of Public Health and our Cal OSHA. Now this imbalance in revenue and operating expenses ultimately put transit agencies in a position of retreat and threatened to create a death spiral for agencies across the state in which declines in revenue would lead to service cutbacks, making transit ultimately less attractive and then leading to further revenue declines and so on. As such, my association's efforts to support the transit industry over the past years has been focused on securing the emergency operating funding 
four transit agencies that, that Robert detailed, uh, and were steered uh, within my association by our COVID-19 Transit Crisis Relief Task Force. Now, to elevate our request for additional funding support, my association organized a coalition of close to 40 organizations. Uh, that coalition was comprised of transportation, labor, environmental, and public health organizations that engaged directly in the emergency, emergency funding discussions in Congress, meeting with members of our California legislative delegation almost daily. And that worked to amplify the national campaign for emergency funding for public transit agencies that was organized by our partners at the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, now, Robert had detailed that between the CARES Act, CRIS, and the American Rescue Plan, transit agencies nationwide received about $69.5 billion in emergency relief. From those, package, from those packages, California transit agencies received about $10 billion uh, in emergency relief that was dedicated to addressing their most immediate operational needs. Now, of course, this panel is about public transit agencies and what they will do when that lifeline funding runs out. And, and here this, this question or this prompt is generally one that is fairly difficult to respond to because our industry, like industries across the economy, is being charged with planning for a future that remains incredibly deeply uncertain. We don't know, for example, if work from home will become an enduring feature of the American workplace, if negative perceptions about transit safety will extend beyond the immediate future, or if key funding sources for transit, which in California means the sales tax on diesel fuel, the quarter cent sales tax on goods, as well as local option sales taxes, will rebound and remain strong. And as an aside, I'll, I'll note that the state of the diesel sales tax in particular is further complicated by improving fuel efficiency uh, for, for trucks, for example, and the rise of, of EVs. Now, in the short term, uh, we're also concerned about uh, the sales of big ticket items like automobiles, uh, which are being depressed by the global shortage of key componentry, which will have an impact on sales tax revenues that support public transit capital and operations. Now, the good news is that we have some time to figure this out. Uh, we estimate that the federal funding provided through those three relief packages will keep most transit agencies in California whole until at least quarter one, 2023. And while this uncertainty remains, the core recovery strategies being pursued by transit agencies are generally focused on regrow regrowing transit ridership and demonstrating our value proposition to once and would be riders. Now, we obviously cannot predict the future, but we can work to show the traveling public that public transit is indispensable to their communities. And to be specific, transit agencies in the state are working uh, with the state government and their local governments to pursue common sense projects that grant transit vehicles priority on shared infrastructure. In Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland, we've seen the rapid expansion of transit-only lanes that pull transit vehicles out of mixed traffic. In these cities and others, progress is also being made to deliver bus rapid transit, which promises travel time savings over your local or regional bus services. Now, as an association, we've also sought to support these efforts by pursuing legislation, which I'll note is currently sitting on the governor's desk, that will ensure transit agencies have the statutory and enforcement authorities they need to discourage driving and parking in these transit-only lanes, as well as at bus stops. Now, next year, we will be pursuing legislation uh, that is of interest to a variety of my members to authorize transit agencies to operate on select highway shoulders during peak travel times, and we are actively supporting the Newsom administration's Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, which focuses on, among other things, inciting mode shift to high-capacity public transit and also reorienting some of the state's discretionary revenues for transportation to shared modes of mobility, including public transportation. Now, as an association, we have also helped enact new law providing transit agencies with the ability to claim CEQA exemptions for certain narrow band of transit projects, including transit prioritization projects, like transit only lanes, signal coordination, and ramp meters, allowing such improvements to be delivered more quickly. Transit agencies are also pursuing projects to make riding public transit easier and thus more attractive to their communities. In Monterey, Santa Barbara, and, and Sacramento, 
transit agencies are outfitting their transit vehicles with open loop payment systems supported by the Caltrans led California Integrated Travel Project that will allow riders to pay transit fares with the Visa card they already have in their wallets. And transit agencies are also taking steps to deliver more equitable service. Agencies across the state are conducting comprehensive operational analyses to understand how their ridership centers have changed during the pandemic and to, to determine how best to deliver quality transit service within their constrained budgets. Now, as an association, we are supporting efforts in Congress currently included in the Build Back Better Act to provide new operating funds for transit agencies for services that expand access to jobs and housing. And if approved, these funds can be used to establish new transit routes, expand service areas, increase service levels, and provide fare free and reduced fare service. And these advocacy efforts generally expand on our support for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which will deliver the largest investments in public transit and rail in our country's history. Finally, through the state budget, we have also worked with the Newsom administration and the state legislature to address vestigial and counterproductive provisions in state law, which have historically discouraged transit agencies from conducting those COAs, making improvements to their fare ticketing systems, and offering fare-free or discounted transit service to their riders. And these changes uh, that we had pursued were signed into law by Governor Newsom earlier this year. Now, as we move forward, you can expect that transit agencies will continue to iterate and improve on the services they provide. And as an association, we will be actively tracking how quickly agencies expend the funding provided by Congress through those three rounds of emergency funding relief, and also be exploring how that interacts with the return of transit riders, as well as broader economic conditions. Now, should there be a need for additional emergency funding support or additional funding flexibility for transit agencies, we will pursue it. So thanks for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm looking forward to engaging in the Q&A portion with Robert and Asha. Thank you, Juan. And thank you, Michael. Um, I will invite Robert and Asha to join on camera and we'll enter the Q&A portion of this webinar. And as a reminder, you can pose questions uh, and vote on questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you um, who we reach out to, to uh, ask your question, we will promote you to panelists and you can have a more interactive experience on video. Uh, but as moderator, I have the prerogative of asking a few of my own uh, questions before we turn over to the audience. And um, so one thing I've been wondering about, and um, you know, I have two of the national experts on transit finance here uh, and, and a California expert, is that the federal funding for transit was distributed by existing formulae and not necessarily by need which would vary based on fare box recovery ratio, uh, additional needs uh, perhaps to clean the system, emergency response for COVID, um, uh, and not necessarily the level of transit demand that a region or a system had um, during COVID. And, and so that will, um, so agencies have money right now, they're not out of money, but my sense is that this will lead to different times at which these agencies run out of federal money that might, it's gonna vary by agency, it might vary by region. Um, I know in Los Angeles where we have low fare box recovery and lots of local sales taxes, it's the federal money is gonna last longer uh, than for some other systems. Uh, I'd like each of you to comment on this phenomenon because it's, it's a very different, they're very different politically because it's not necessarily all operators in the same boat. Some, some boats are, sinking before others, so. I'll start with Asha. I'm so sorry, Juan, I kind of lost the question. <laughs> Could you repeat just oh, okay. the, the actual question part? Um, so the idea that the federal money, the supplement mm -hmm. is going to last, it's going to fill a hole that lasts a different amount of time mm -hmm. for, okay. for different operators um, and some will run out of money sooner than others. I mean, I think that is, it, I'm not quite sure what to say beyond it's true. Um, and, and again, I think one of the most important things as we think about 
how to fund transit in general is to remember how unique every agency is and what works even for you know 75 percent great may be a disaster for the other 25 percent so i wish i could say something more insightful but i'll, I'll just say you're right <laughs> robert is this a concern at the federal level yeah no i think ash is right that, it, that we didn't take into consideration the uniqueness of the different agencies especially with the cares act and give give them a break a little bit that they i mean it was done very quickly just had a couple of days and they just used you know, like with the with the um, with the recovery package in 2009 2010 they just use existing delivery mechanisms right so i think 90 percent of that money went to the urbanized areas based on the existing formulas may not have made sense may not have been the most practical thing at the time they then tweaked that for the second um the second piece of recovery money and then the american jobs plan as i understand it i do not know the details um you know it was designed to fix that much better so it's it's really a factor of speed um, that that affected the first you know the first tranche of money and then as they add time a little more thoughtfulness those those programs got better as it went on. And and Michael, has this been a concern of your members? Um, I know that uh, and I would, an agency like BART will have a very different fare box recovery than VTA or Metro. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely has been a concern for my membership. I think the challenge that we're faced with and that this will exist within my association or at the national level through APTA uh, is a necessity to reach consensus amongst very varying uh, interests and really driving consistent message that ultimately leads to success in Congress. Uh, and frankly, it is easier for us as an industry to default to that which is noble than to present an alternative that may look right in the moment, but that may see that may be necessary to adjust or change as facts on the ground change. And so I'll just you know pause it here that um, in the early days, one of the chief concerns that we had, of course, was a significant drop in ridership. And so that might lead uh, folks in in my association and ultimately in Congress to say we should direct those monies to those agencies that are experiencing fare box decline. Now, we, what we ended up seeing, though, is that ultimately the economy slowed down. With that downturn meant that sales taxes also came down. And so for those agencies that were more heavily reliant on sales taxes, that might mean that you would have to reorient the structure of your funding mechanisms. And so, again, while it is a concern, it's a very, very difficult question or you know, proposition to address directly uh, because, again, dynamics will change. And it's hard to create a structure that's going to be fully responsive to those dynamics as they change. The focus on consensus building is ultimately, I think, what we need in order to drive um, consensus in Congress and ultimately secure monies for the industry. The final point I'd make here is that there are conversations that are happening at the urbanized level, at the, the regional level, to try to uh, make amends with this reality that some agencies are going to be in more immediate need uh, by um, allocating in phases uh, the funding that has been provided to Congress and directing it to where it's most directly needed at the time that it's needed. So um, I'll, I'll end there and, and turn it back to you. If I could, Juan, I'll just throw out a couple of other kind of interesting distinctions that impact all of this among agencies. One is how widely different their fare box recovery rates are. So you have some agencies that are, you know, not too many, been in California few getting like 50%. Um, and then you have others that are maybe getting 10%. And historically, I think we've kind of gone to the agencies that were not, you know, had didn't have a very high rate. Well, in some ways, they look like the smart ones right now, because even if they have zero riders, it's not such a big hit on their, their fare box. And then the other thing, just to emphasize what Michael was saying about you know, how much variation there is and how you have to look at many different taxes. Um, there's some counties where actually sales tax revenues have been up in California after maybe like the very beginning of COVID. And I, I've been doing interviews around the state with um, transportation and general finance experts. And I've talked to a few who are like, hey, I'm flush right now. Um, it's never looked better. They aren't necessarily transit operators specifically. But so again, it's just hard to know how we provide a broad solution that you know is fair and works in all these circumstances. Well, maybe we can hear from a transit operator. We do have an audience question. 
uh, from Chris on Duchak. Chris, uh, can you let us know who you are and what your question is? Uh, hi, uh, everyone. I'm Chris Andrichek. I'm the Chief Financial Officer at AC Transit up in Oakland. And the question I had posed was that, you know, over the past couple of decades, uh, a lot of localities, you know, more so in the larger metros have um, added sales taxes to support transportation and transit. And a lot of those areas, uh, you know, I know particularly looking at like the Bay Area, they're kind of reaching their statutory limits for how much sales tax they can have. And so I wonder, you know, what is what is the sort of arc of local funding or just transit funding in general look like if sales tax is sort of not a, not as much of an option anymore? Uh, and also because of the, you know, as often gets raised uh, in our area by advocates, is that it's a it's a relatively regressive way to pay for things. So I wonder if the panelists could comment on what what might be next uh, for sales tax and other funding. Yeah, I think that's a question for Asha and Michael. Um, Robert might have a perspective on California, but our um, transportation finance is complex and involves ferries at the state level as well. Michael, do you want to start? So sure, I'll, I'll jump in. And what I would acknowledge here is that routinely over the years, what we have seen is those uh, counties that are running up against that statutory limit have often run legislation to see that statutory limit increase. And so I know that that is a crude way of addressing perhaps the, the question that you've posited around just generally the viability of sales tax increases moving forward. That is one option that has been available uh, to counties. County of Los Angeles, which I think has three or four uh, local option sales taxes, has routinely gone to the legislature to have that cap lifted. I think more generally, though, to this question about the reg regressivity of sales taxes, uh, that is, of course, a, a very real uh, challenge for us as an industry. Of course, there are ways to address that uh, by, um, by means of how you are directing that funding. Um, for example, operations versus capital. Uh, we know that big capital projects uh, will take decades often to be delivered. Uh, service level increases, for example, uh, can deliver near-term benefits primarily to those communities that are uh, low income. That said, I think it is a, a fair point that we need to expand uh, the pool of, of funds that are available to agencies. One of the things that we have long considered as an association is how do we grow the funding that is available from cap and trade for transit operations in particular? This low carbon transit operations program that goes off, goes out to agencies on a knowable formula structure related to the state transit assistance program. And we sought to double that funding to make sure that agencies have easy access to funds that frankly are going to a purpose that very clearly reduces greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, that's one strategy we pursued at the state level. Uh, of course, we are uh, always pulling our members for new ideas for how we might um, create new options uh, for addressing uh, operations in particular without the need to necessarily go to uh, local option sales taxes uh, as that necessary default. And so this is a question I've been thinking about a great deal. And I don't think there's an easy answer to, you know, if we've tapped out sales taxes, what do we do next? But just some, some ideas that I think are very heavy lift politically, but maybe worth pursuing. Um, so one is, and I'm online, so nobody could actually throw anything at me. And in this crowd, you probably wouldn't anyway, but Proposition 13. Local government used to rely on property taxes to fund an enormous amount of services. As a side note, my mom grew up in a farming town of 400 people, and they had so much money for their schools, they flew in a music teacher from Boston um, who lived there and just taught at that school. So anyway, if we change the way we allow localities to assess property taxes, we could have a lot more revenue. Now, would it get spent on public transit because of many competing interests that would need to be worked out? Also thinking though about what are some broad bases that we could tax, um, especially if we didn't want to have these, if we wanted transit operators to have to hire fewer finance <laughs> experts <laughs> to juggle, you know, dozens of different things. Um, the gas tax, 
many people are very aware that eventually it's probably not going to be a useful option, but right now still a whole lot of people buy a whole lot of gasoline. Um, in theory, we could raise that rate and use some of it for transit. Um, and then the option that many are exploring as a long-term alternative would be, well, what if we had a mileage fee that, and one of the nice things about a mileage fee is depending on how it's administered in the technology, you could have rates that vary according to where people drive. Um, and so I, I think I actually heard someone from San Diego publicly express the same idea, which most people I've talked to have like shuddered in horror, which is, well, what if you had a statewide mileage fee and then you allowed counties or regions to impose a local surcharge, so to speak? Um, and if you have a you know, very expensive system and lots of public transit, maybe some of that money could then fund it. So again, I don't think any of these three ideas are gonna happen around the corner, but they're long-term goals that I think would be important to, to see if we can work towards. And they, uh, Michael Manville, if you were on the webinar, he point out that a mileage-based user fee that depends on where you're traveling sounds a lot like congestion pricing, um, but not necessarily a first best congestion pricing system. Okay. I, do you have a question uh, channeling uh, one from my boss? Uh, so the moderator's prerogative can extend to Brian Taylor as well. Um, and that's for Robert. And um, so the question is, what do you think are the longer term prospects for federal subsidy of public trans transit systems? Should ridership continue to lag in the years ahead? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, this, this, let's just assume this infrastructure bill does pass. I mean, that's five years of funding, which is helpful. <clears throat> that may, that seems to be about what some general managers of transit agencies are preparing their boards um, to be looking out for, that they think, you know, we don't expect to get back to where we were or, you know, to 85% of where we were or 90% of where we were until, you know, for another like five years. So that seems to be about the right, about the right time. Who knows, right? I mean, I couldn't sit here and tell you that um, that we think that 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 those predictions are correct, but that's what they seem to be preparing for. Um, in some places, they are then using this time to readjust their schedules and make new kinds of uh, or doing some some innovations, running you know less vehicles and, and less service during the traditional peak, spreading it out throughout the the, the, the work week and on weekends in order to capture different types of riders, recognizing that there is a, a clear um, social equity um, and, and uh, you know, concern about this as a, as a, or transit as a social service. That might attract more riders, that might have a different role for transit, but it's, it, it's, hard, it's really just hard to say, Brian, <laughs> it's for, for a lot of people. But one thing I think is for sure that it's changing, that transit is changing. It's very hard to find a transit agency around the country that isn't thinking differently about who they are, how they operate, and what their role in, in, um, in, in both moving people and in supporting their regions is. So that's a good thing, I think, in a lot of ways. I mean, I really, uh, you know, it's a never let a crisis go to waste kind of thing. But in terms of how long, I, I just, I, it's anybody's guess now, but I just believe these, these general managers seems to be about five years for some kind of normalcy. And is there an appetite at the federal level to expand the constituency of, of these transit agencies? So one thing I'm particular I'm thinking about is right now it's difficult for a transit agency to operate a bike share system or to spend federal funds and sometimes matching state funds on, on shared mobility uh, broadly. And um, we are seeing that those some of those systems publicly operated uh, do quite well, uh, but they're operated by others and not the public transit agency and without uh, FTA funds. Is, is there any appetite for uh, enabling shared mobility expenses as part of transit? That's a good question. I, I don't know about the federal level. I can tell you there certainly is some interest in that on the regional level, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of agencies that are very um, overtly trying to position themselves as mobility managers for their regions. Um, as aggregators for all these new different kinds of services. Um, you know, I don't know what the implication would be then on the federal level. There, again, as I said, there's so much of this discretionary money in these 
um, you know, that, that, that the department's going to have to work with, you know, there may be some creativity that comes out of out of those things that there's interest in in different kinds of cross um, department programs and and things like that. And there's a huge appetite for places to or for from on the federal level to be innovative, right? So if they're getting a bunch of agencies saying that this is the way that we want to go, um, I think there might be some opportunity there. I don't know specifically how it's programmed. You know, once the lawyers get involved, then you know that all might go to hell. But um, I'd say it's. I'd say the prospects seem, seem okay for that. And Michael, are you seeing any uh, demand for that on the state level? The idea that a transit agency may take on uh, other types of shared mobility? I would say generally, yes. However, I've seen primarily the interest from larger urbanized area operators, less so from the medium and small agencies. And a lot of that I think speaks to just uh, technical capacity the in-house staff to be able to manage such programs. I would say though that as it's been presented to me, it is typically been less about right-sizing the finances or I, I should say correcting the finances of, of agencies and more uh, along the lines of what Robert referenced, this idea that agencies could move into the space of being mobility managers. Uh, obviously the private sector has moved very, very aggressively to deliver shared mobility options. At times, that is to the detriment of the public, whether we're talking about the way that uh, folks that have functional needs are able to navigate the streetscape, or even uh, how a bus is able to pull into uh, a curb and allow passengers off. There's some benefit that can be provided if everything was done uh, by a transit agency. But again, uh, the interest seems to be sparse and primarily from those agencies that already have significant resources, uh, staffing, and, and, and otherwise. To be able to manage such efforts. Okay, we, we do have another audience question. This one is from Mari. Uh, Mari, can you go on camera? And unmute yourself. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Mari, pronouns she and they, and I am a master's of urban planning student um, at San Jose State. It's nice to see you, Asha. Um, and I was just wondering, I had a question about one of the slides in Robert's presentation about the um, amount of funding from each of the federal spending packages. And um, the last two, I, if I remember correctly, the, the one in the middle was only about half spent and the other one was barely spent at all. Do transit agencies have plans to spend the rest of this money? How long is that going to take? You know, what is the? I would assume they need the money for projects, um, but are they are they actually able to spend it in the in the time frame that they have? Uh, that's a great question, and the my answer just comes from from APTA, from the American Public Transit Association here in here in Washington. They're the ones who've been collecting that data. Their CEO just testified in front of Congress last week, within the last two weeks, um, where all this came from. He um, asserts that from a survey of their members that it's all going to be spent by 2023, 24, I forget the exact date. But so that would assume that yes, there are plans to get that done. I would assume that you know, the, the, lot, the big tranche of money that came out from the CARES Act was emergency money that they use just to keep the, the systems going. Um, you know, I don't, it, I don't believe it's going for, I think the reason it was dragged in front of Congress to begin with is because I don't think Congress is interested in spending a whole bunch of money on transit right now um, other than keeping the system operating for people who need it, right? So protecting the workers who are at these agencies now, um, you know, keep, you know pre providing, preventing furloughs and trying to keep service levels at, a, at, at you know, at, at, at a reasonable level. So I suspect that the short answer is that the, the plans are to run that out for the next couple of years. It may not be spent yet, but I'm sure that these agencies have some plans for them. Thank you, Robert. Michael or Asha, did you have anything you wanted to add? I have just one brief remark, and that would be that some of the slowness in getting dollars out the door has been the ability for agencies to return service levels to pre-pandemic levels. And a lot of the complicating factor there has been the workforce shortage that many agencies are, are faced with. I hear on a daily basis from our transit agencies for just having difficulty um, filling uh, the, the roles that would be necessary to get service out on the street. Um, of course, with the ongoing pandemic, uh, we also have uh, situations where our already thinned out workforce uh, is having to call out because of COVID infection for themselves or members of their family, 
Uh, and again, as a result, we're just not able to get those service levels out on the road. And so I think as we start to turn the corner on the pandemic and we have a return to some degree of normalcy, there may be an ability for us to expend those dollars with greater speed to really meet the needs of the community. But right now, that what is one of the, the core challenges that we face as an industry. Thank you, Michael. And next, we'll hear from uh, Jessica Meany, an audience member in, in this webinar session. Uh, we'll be in Michael's role as respondent in our next week's session on equity and transit. So I'll put a link in the chat if you want to register for that session. So Jessica, what is your question? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my question is to all the panelists, is there a transit agency across the country that comes to mind that really knocked it out of the park, responded really well during our early days of COVID in 2020, especially for bus riders? I mean, as I think Robert, you, you touched on this and we felt it extraordinarily in Los Angeles. We didn't lose that much bus ridership. Um, those who rely on the bus in Los Angeles have really no other choice. And you could see it, some of our lines were at 60 to 70% in March of 2020. Is there an agency that you saw redirect funding, prioritize for operations, or you would just say, wow, they really paid attention to bus riders during COVID? And if you're stumped so much, but I hope you- I'm hope mentally you. scanning the country. Um, I'll tell you at first, um, there's a couple of places I know that were going to make bad decisions that were going, you know, that were looking at what I would, you know, to, to be charitable, we're looking, probably looking at low ridership routes and saying, yeah, we're going to start lopping these things off. And then, you know, a little bit of analysis took place. People said, those are the routes that are, that are going through low income communities or going through places where there's super dependent ridership on transit. And that would be a terrible idea, you know, um, and so they, a lot of agencies, a lot, several agencies I can think of had to redirect and had to change those plans, quite frankly, and say, okay, yeah, we're not, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna kind of, we're gonna uh, address the, the, the routes and the um, service that is traditionally fo you know, funneling white collar workers from the suburbs downtown, right? Because nobody, that, that's where a lot of the decline was. This region, I think, the Washington region was one example. I think Baltimore was another one. I just, and there's a couple of them around the country that I can think of. Um, but I like what they've actually done in this region. And um, since then, <laughs> I'll say that, um, that's one place where they really have kind of tried to rebalance the ridership and um, have um, much longer headways during the traditional rush hour. I can tell you, I experienced that, but much better service in off-peak hours, you know, for, for people who are transit dependent on the weekends, things like that. So, yeah, I really like what they've done here for that. Um, and I thought, why well, as I was talking, I remember some more places, but that's that's a good one to start with. Thanks. Yeah, because one question that's come up in Los Angeles is how are like some of our federal relief funds being prioritized for the communities most impacted by COVID? And I don't think we've really necessarily come up with a, a good solution or answer to that. Um, but I, I appreciate that those examples and, and that. So thank you. Michael, did you have a, a thought on that or a last word? I know you have to run yeah. off. Yeah, the only thing that I would mention on this space is why I wouldn't necessarily point to any one agency. I, I don't know that I have that, that form of, of visibility into exactly how they've been responsive to their communities. What I will say is that I did hear quite a lot from agencies that were taking creative approaches to service delivery. I think this is probably one of the undersold or undertold stories of the pandemic is the reality that agencies were incredibly nimble in recognizing that they could not continue to provide that same form of fixed route service that they did pre-pandemic. We saw the rise of, or I should say the introduction of microtransit services uh, in agencies across the state of California uh, that recognized for those areas where service on that fixed route was underperforming, they could replace it at least as a, uh, as a stopgap measure with microtransit service as a way of continuing to provide that service, uh, making sure that that service is actually more effective than the fixed route service that it was uh, replacing, and then redirecting some of the resources that were uh, previously going to that fixed route service uh, to areas where there was high uh, ridership. One of the other things though that they did was they were very responsive to the public health emergency. Uh, many of them stepped in to do food deliveries. Uh, many of them stepped in to up their um, ability to provide access to things like medical care, 
and in vaccinations. And this was something that frankly we saw across the state, uh, though very heavily in rural areas where folks that were relying on public transit are truly those who are relying on it as a lifeline. And we saw the public transit operators step up in a way to provide the social services that other outfits of, of counties just simply weren't able to do. And so, um, you know, while that doesn't speak necessarily to, you know, those that did it best, it certainly speaks to how agencies were responsive to the position that they were in, the position that they found their communities in, uh, to be able to fill gaps that were necessary to fill. Uh, and so with that, I do want to thank everyone, though, for uh, the opportunity. I, I unfortunately have to hop off for a, a 2 p.m. meeting. So thank you all. Thank you, Michael. And and um, thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Asha Agawal, Robert Fuentes, um, and, and Michael for joining us today and imparting us with your wisdom and knowledge on this emerging topic, uh, so emerging that, uh, you know, that, that to-do list, I think, changes on a daily basis. I know we're a university transportation center uh, looking at the infrastructure bill for continuance of that program. And one day I'll get a push alert knowing if, uh, if and when um, that, and I imagine others on the, on the phone are eagle, or on the webinar are eagerly awaiting that information as well. And I'd also um, like to thank our session sponsor for uh, contributing to the Arrowhead Symposium and this session, uh, the Transit Center. And uh, thank you to all of the attendees uh, for joining us. I hope you learned a lot in this session. I, I certainly did, and I, and I put it together. Um, and then a reminder for our next session, Transit for People. Uh, focus on equity and transit. We'll have moderator Dr. Tierra Bills of Wayne State University and speakers Sharice McMillan of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and David Bragdon of Transit Center and investing in places Jessica Meany, who you just saw as a respondent. Um, so please do register for that. Uh, the website you can have uh, more information at is UCLA Arrowhead Symposium.org. All right, thank you for joining and have a good day.